So now let's get into the Word of God. Uh, let me start by saying, of course, uh, when you pray, you speak to God. Never forget this. Say this after me. When I pray, when I, pray, I, speak pray. I, speak I speak to God. When I study His Word, I study His Word. He, speaks he speaks to me. I always ask people, you know, God, what did God say to you? Oh, no, God hasn't talked to me in a long time. No, that's not the issue. You haven't studied the Word in a long time. Always when you get into the Word of God, God speaks to you. So it's never a problem. You know, did you know that God wants to talk to you all day? You know, that's why He, when Jesus was at the cross, did you know this? When Jesus was at the cross and, and, and the earthquake occurred, remember that? Where the stone was moved, did you know that earthquake caused the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies? Because only the high priest could go into the holy of holies, and he had to be clean. They had to put a bell on his leg and a rope, so that if that bell stopped ringing, he died because he wasn't clean. And they'd have to pull him out, and somebody else had to be the next high priest. Well, on that day, the veil split in half and ripped open. And by the way, if you're wondering how that veil was, it's 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and 5 feet deep. That's how thick that veil was. And it just split in half. Why? So you and I can come boldly to the throne room. We don't need someone else to be a mediator. We can go right in to the presence of God because He's been waiting to talk to you. So does he want to talk to you? Yes, he does. Does he also talk through his word? Most, let me just say this, most of your revelation will come from studying the word of God. You get into the Bible and you'll say, oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, oh yes, yeah, okay, yeah, I got that, I got that. But if you won't open your Bible, guess what? You got, God, God, God's got nothing to tell you about. Amen? So we're going to get into the word of God. And we told you we're changing the, <laughs> the uh, conference title now from... Uh, uh, the secret weapon to conceal and carry. Amen. That's what it's going to be, conceal and carry. And we're going to teach, just to give you an overview, uh, we, we had the overview last night. Did you, how many of you were here last night? Did you enjoy last night? Yeah. Had a good time last night. Today we're going to talk about one word. You may want to write it down. Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, which literally means legal entry. And then... Uh, why was tongues given? We're going to go into deeper into that tonight. And then we're going to talk about uh, the perfect prayer, which we're going to do Saturday morning. And then uh, we're going to talk about how to get others to fill with the Holy Spirit praying in tongues. This is not something that pastors and evangelists, apostles, prophets should do. It's every believer. Every believer will lay hands on the sick. Okay, not the fivefold. Every believer will get people filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. Amen? I th like I said to you last night, I've used a teaching, which I'm going to share with you tomorrow night. Over 5,000 gave their lives, uh, uh, got filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. So this is something that each one of us can do. Amen? When people come to me and say, I've got an aunt, she needs to be filled. I tell them, okay, now listen to this series. <laughs> you can get them filled. You don't need me to do that. Amen? Did you know that we all have the same anointing? Did you know we all have the same Holy Ghost? Did you know that I don't have a bigger Holy Ghost than you got? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we can do this. Amen. And then, of course, uh, Sunday morning we're going to teach on the different types of tongues. There is a variety of tongues. There's some tongues are public, some tongues are private. And then there is a discernment of tongues. And then there is a different uh, kinds of tongues. Sometimes your tongue language can sound African. Sometimes it can sound uh, Chinese. Because there's different kinds of tongues. And then, of course, Sunday night, we're going to talk about the benefits, the ten benefits of speaking in tongues. Amen? So that, that's just a little overview. Go to our base scripture. Our base scripture is, of course, I'm going to do this really fast. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 18. This chapter is all about the armor of God. Everybody say the armor of God. And we found out that we put on the breastplate, we put the, the uh, shot on our feet, the proper pre preparation of the gospel of peace, we uh, put on a helmet of salvation. What do we do now? We pick up the shield of faith and we put the sword of the spirit. Why? So that we can be ready. We have to have the armor on. But it didn't finish in verse 17. The armor includes praying always with all prayer in supplication in the spirit. When you're praying in the Spirit, you're praying in your heavenly language. You're praying in tongues. So the armor is not complete till you pray in tongues. Oh, I got the armor on. How much time did you spend praying in tongues today? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, then you are not complete. Everybody shout, get dressed. Get dressed. Get dressed. 
you're not dressed unless you're praying in the Spirit. Amen. So now, that, that's, this hasn't been taught much, but it's time that the church woke up and realized that praying in the Spirit is not what you do for two minutes while you're driving down the road. It is something serious, and it was a serious weapon given for a serious purpose. Everybody say, serious weapon, serious weapon. For, a serious for a serious purpose. And we got to take it that seriously. Amen? In fact, I tell you what, it's the greatest weapon God has ever given you. Because it unleashes the power that is in you. That's what this does. So that's why we need to start doing that. Amen? Unleash that power. All right. We found out that um, two things are critical uh, when you're praying in the Spirit. Number one, faith. We went through that scripture. And number two, thanksgiving. Why? Because if you're not uh, praying in faith, nothing's going to happen. You, but I don't know what I'm praying about. That's okay. You could, did you know you can release your faith without knowing what you're praying about? Oh, you didn't know that? Okay, let me show you the scripture. I was going to go there later today, but we'll do it right now. Go with me to Job, Jode, Ju, <laughs> Jude 20. <laughs> 120. Jude 1.20. Uh, please make sure your cell phones are turned off or put on vibrate which I'm doing right now. There you go. There we go. Putting it all on vibrate. All right. Jude one twenty. You, but you, beloved, uh huh, build yourself up. We'll talk about that later. How? In your most holy faith. How do I build myself up in my most holy faith? Praying in the holy spirit. Amen? If you're down, stop praying in tongues. It'll change your world. All right. So we've got to have faith and we've got to have thanksgiving. That's why we went to this scripture. I think we went to Matthew 21, 22. Matthew 21, 22. This was a scripture on faith and it had to do with uh, prayer. Whatever you ask for in prayer, having what? Faith. Believing you will receive it. In other words, if you don't have faith when you're praying in tongues, guess what? It ain't going to happen. Those are elements that every prayer needs to have. And the next one was, of course, uh, Philippians 4, 6. You cannot close your prayer without saying thank you. Philippians 4, 6. And it says, do not be afraid of anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance, in everything, by prayer and petition, with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving seals your faith. Remember that. Your faith isn't sealed without thanksgiving. And joy is the voice of faith. We talked about that last night too. Okay, so those things are critical. And then we went into some scriptures that was critical for you to understand, and that was in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And what does Jesus say? Acts chapter 1, verse 4. While being in their company and eating, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. So in other words, he's saying, number one, you can't evangelize the world. You can't get people healed, delivered, and set free. You cannot fulfill my plan. That's what he's saying until this happens. So don't even leave home without him. Because you'll be out there trying your best to accomplish something and you won't even fulfill the plan. Why? You'll fall flat on your face. That's how serious this is. Don't leave your house. Mm. Mm. Next verse. What did the father promise that I've got to have before I leave my house? For John baptized with water, but not many days from now you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now let me ask you a question. Who was he talking to? Everybody say the disciples. Were they saved? Yes. Because the blood was already on the mercy seat. Remember that? This is, this is where the 40 days he walked on the earth after the resurrection. So they were all saved. And even the saved people, the first thing he says is, you are not equipped. You're not equipped. That's why you've got to be praying in the Spirit. Until you're praying in the Spirit, you don't have the full armor of God. You are not equipped to do anything for me right now. You need the Holy Spirit. And then what happens when you get the Holy Spirit? We went to Acts 1.8. 
you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we discovered yesterday from the scriptures, it was not physical power. It was not mental power. It was spiritual power. But what is a spiritual power? The power that is released by praying in tongues. Everybody say, tongue power. power. That's what the power was he's talking about. Uh Uh-huh. Verse, Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. That you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That was tongues power. And watch this. When you receive the tongue power, uh uh-huh, and you shall be my witnesses. So you can't even be a witness without this power. So you need this Holy Spirit power of speaking in tongues to be a witness where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And yet we've got missionaries traveling all over the world without the tongue power, or not using the tongue power because they don't know what it is, and certainly not bringing that power to the countries that they're supposed to be evangelizing. Something wrong with this picture. My brothers and sisters, let me just say this. Um, Jesus never ever said make converts. The church said make converts. What did Jesus say? Make disciples. The Greek word disciple is disciplined one. Disciplined in what area? Every area. Including praying in tongues. Yes. That's what he asked us to do. Go into all the world and make disciples, disciplined ones that will continually pray in the Spirit. Amen? So that's why this was so, so important. Uh, very, and then it happened in Acts 2, verse 1. You know what happened. Let's go over there. Acts 2, verse 1. What does this power accomplish? Well, the Bible says that they got filled. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled in one place. 120 men plus women and children. 200 people in that upper room at that time. Okay, and I've been to the upper room. We'll go there when we go to the Holy Land. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing of a violent tempest. So what they did here was a sound. And the only thing I can tell you is what made that sound, seven trillion angels were released on planet earth at the same moment. And they're already on the earth right now. Amen. Seven trillion. How do you know it's seven trillion? Because the Bible talks about angels as being countless. Now how many is countless? You can't count them. The Bible refers to angels as numberless. You can't number them. So if each person on planet earth was given at least a thousand angels, that would be seven trillion. There's only one problem with seven trillion. You know what that is, Neil? You can, it's a number. <laughs> you can count them. So we know it had to be at least more than that. Okay? So the angels were released. That's why when we pray to get people filled with the Holy Spirit, there isn't a sonic boom today. That only happened at that time. Boom. The angels are already on the earth right now. Now, all right, uh, fill the whole house where they were sitting. Next verse, Acts 2 3. And there appeared to them, appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were separated. Everybody, everybody say, resembling. resembling. They didn't see fire, they got hot. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes on you, it can get a little warm. Amen? Yeah. That's okay. Okay, it's distributed and settled on each one of them. That means they all got hot. 200 people got hot. Next verse. And they, 200, were all. Everybody say all. All. There was no segregation. Men get filled. Women don't get filled. Ministers get filled. Congregation don't get filled. There's no segregation. Every man, woman, and child. Can I tell you a little story? Okay, you're going to love this. Uh, My wife was putting the two uh, little ones to bed. I was traveling teaching in a church, so I wasn't there. She had a rocking chair. She had one on one knee and the other one on the other knee. The five-year-old was on one knee. The two-year-old was on the other knee. She's rocking back and forth, back and forth before they go to bed. And then she says, okay, let's pray now, boys. It's time to go to bed. They prayed in the understanding. And then she said, okay, let's pray in the Spirit. So my wife started praying in the Spirit. Then she said to Matthew, pray in the Spirit. My five-year-old, he's already filled with the Holy Ghost. He starts praying in the Spirit. He says to the Josiah, the two-year-old, stop praying in the Spirit. He says, no, mummy. He said, Josiah, pray in the Spirit. No, mummy. Matthew jumps up, the five-year-old. He says, mummy, I know why Josiah doesn't pray in tongues. Why? He's not filled. A five-year-old figured it out. So, so, so she said, well, okay, lay, Matthew, lay hands on him and get him filled. Matthew said, no, mummy. Matthew James, when every time she says Matthew James, the middle name, that means it ain't, this is not negotiable. Matthew James, lay hands on him and get him filled. So Matthew, 
went over, put his hand on Josiah's head, and said, be filled with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Well, nothing happened, okay? Now she puts him back on her knee, and she says, okay, let's pray in the Spirit before we go to bed. She's praying in tongues. Matthew praying in tongues. The five-year-old praying in tongues. Josiah praying in tongues. Because a five-year-old laid hands on a two-year-old, the two-year-old exploded in his tongue language. Come on now. Every man, woman, and child should be praying in the Spirit. God's given that gift to everybody. To you, your children, those that are far off, everybody should have this gift. Amen? You can't accomplish His plan without it. But what's the point of having a gift if you don't use it? I know a lot of Christians filled with the Holy Ghost. They all speak in tongues, but... Let me rephrase that. They all can speak in tongues, but do they all speak in tongues? No. (laughs) And that's the issue. That's why we're having this conference. Amen? Amen. So we can find out what it is, why it is, and how to use it. Amen? So, uh, where was that? Yep. And they give them... As the Spirit kept giving them clear and loud expression. So who gave them their tongue language? Everybody shout, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost gave them their tongue language. All right. uh, Come with me to Mark 16, 17. I have a real problem with denominational churches. And they don't invite me to come speak. And I understand that. They didn't save me, heal me, deliver me, or set me free. Why? This is the problem I have with denominational churches. The ones that do not believe in the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Everybody say, I believe. So what are these signs? In my name, they will what? Let's find out. Drive out demons. Yep. That means every one of us believers have the authority to drive out demons. Amen. All you've got to do is say, get, and believe it. Remember, you speak the word with authority or the devil will. So you better speak like you, you actually believe it. <laughs> and he's got to go. But what, what else did Jesus say? They will speak. Now, if we put this in the King James, it says, they will speak in other words tongues. Let's put it up in the King James. Okay, Mark 16, 17 in the King James says, and these signs will follow them who believe. In my name they'll cast out devils and they will speak with new tongues. Now, wait a minute. Jesus said all believers will speak in new tongues. Now, either we believe Jesus or we don't. But you can't turn around and say, I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I just don't believe what he said. That don't work. <laughs> and then, then there are people that will tell you that tongues has passed away. Well, I'm going to cover that scripture too. So you never have to be confused about that nonsense anymore. Amen? You've got an incredible weapon to literally evangelize the world. Get them healed. Deliver, oh, get them healed. Did you know you can get people healed? Amen. Did you know you can lay hands on the sick? Okay, now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. This is heavy. All the people that Jesus got healed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are you ready for this? None of them were Christians. I can pray for the Christians. No, you can pray for a Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim. You can pray for anybody and get them healed. Why, why did he say, look, watch this. And these signs will follow them who believe. Oh, by, everybody shout believers. believers. Now, what signs will follow the believer? The believer will lay hands on the sick. It doesn't say the believer will lay hands on another believer. It doesn't say that. (laughs) In other words, you and I have the ability to lay hands on a Hindu and get him healed, a Muslim and get him healed, an atheist and get him healed. You have that authority. You have that ability. We're just not doing it. Amen? I can lay hands on an unbeliever and get him healed. Because none of the people that Jesus got healed were believers. How do you know? The blood wasn't on the mercy seat. So there's no way they could have been a believer. Amen. He hadn't gone to the cross. So stop restricting yourself only to pray for Christians. Amen. Stay with the word. We can get everybody healed. And they will speak in new tongues. All believers were supposed to speak in new tongues. Amen. All believers. Everybody say all believers. All right, let's get into the jurisdiction part now because that's really important. Now, I already told you that uh, the New York Times said that the, f- the speech center of the brain, 
the speech center of, now these are non-Christians, the speech center of the brain is inactive when you're praying in tongues. What does the Bible say? Your spirit prays and your mind is unfruitful. That's why the speech center of the brain is inactive when you're praying in tongues. We also found out a professor from Oral Roberts University did a study and discovered there were people that constantly, everybody say constantly, constantly. everybody say consistently, consistently. if you constantly and consistently pray in tongues, your immune system increases 35 to 40 percent. Come on. You're building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Amen? I intend to be here for a long time. How long? Long time. And I intend, I asked the Lord, I need 35 more years. He said, okay, you got it. And I don't want my 35 years, my brother, and, and I know that you're in the special forces, so I understand, I don't want my next 35 years to be in a wheelchair. I want to be healthy, because i got too much to do for God. And so do you. Amen? So I'm going to be healthy for the next 35 years. You say, well, that's not a big deal. Well, it is when you find out that I'm 70 years old. No, I didn't hear enough no ways. I'm, I'm 70 years old. No way. Oh, you make me feel so good. <laughs> I feel a whole lot better now. <laughs> so... So uh, 35 years would be 105. Right. And the Lord said, and if you want more, just ask. That's right. So I said, okay. And I fully believe it. I'm fully persuaded. I'm firmly convinced that I will be healthy and I will be preaching the gospel at 100 years old. No problem. Amen. So what I'm saying to you is you've got to believe. Believers are actually supposed to believe. Amen. If the Bible says it, it's going to happen. Amen. And my immune system is increasing 40%. Why? Because I pray in tongues. Amen? Now, my friend Ted Molay over there, he's 90 years old, but you'd have no idea looking at him. No, no just kidding, Ted. Just kidding. <laughs> I think he's just the same age as me. Amen? And I guess what? We're going strong. Why? Because we pray in the Spirit. When he and I get together, sometimes we pray an hour or two or more just in tongues. Amen? Because we know what it does for the body. And we know what it does for releasing miracles. Did you know in the book of Acts when they got filled, uh, 3,000 3, heard in 18 different languages the gospel and they were just speaking in tongues. There's a miracle right there. 3,000 gave their lives to Christ. There's another miracle. What started the first revival in the church? Tongues. What's going to finish the last revival uh, in the church? Tongues. But nobody is teaching on it. But we need this now. Amen? Everybody shout, we need it. We've got to have this. Amen? We've got an incredible power. Start to use that power. Amen. All right. Come with me to Matthew. We're talking about jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is called legal entry. Legal entry. And you, are, you need to understand that God needs legal entry, first of all, in the English language and then in the tongues language. Okay? We're going to cover both. So you understand. Jurisdiction, let's kick off in Matthew chapter 9. No, yeah, Matthew 9.36. Matthew 9.36. Your tongue language gives God... Everybody say, my tongue language, my tongue language. Gives, God gives God legal entry... Into my future. Into my future. You need to understand that. That's why he said teach on jurisdiction. But when Jesus saw the multitude, uh -huh, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Everybody say sheep, sheep. No, shepherd. no shepherd. Remember, that's the problem, right? Ne next verse. Uh, verse 37. And Jesus said, and then said he unto the disciples, The harvest is plenteous and the labor is a few. Everybody say, labor shortage. labor shortage. So what's the problem? Labor shortage. Not enough pastors. That's the issue. So Jesus said in the next verse, Disciples become laborers. No. No. But that's the problem. I know that's the problem. But listen to what Jesus said. Next verse. Pray. Wow. He didn't say become laborers. He said pray. 
This is the word ask. Mm. Therefore, the Lord of the harvest, uh -huh, that he, the Lord of the harvest, would send laborers into his harvest. Now, why, if it's his harvest, why doesn't he just send laborers? God wants everybody saved. Because he doesn't have jurisdiction. He doesn't have legal entry until somebody asks him. So somebody has to pray. Somebody has to ask. That's why the Bible says, ask and you will what? It doesn't say think about it and you'll receive. It doesn't say pray about it and you'll receive. It doesn't say fast about it and you'll receive. None of those scriptures in the Bible. What does it say? Ask. You have not because you ask not. So for some reason, my asking determines if God can send laborers into his harvest. Hmm. Hmm. If I don't ask, God is not able to send laborers into his harvest. I'm not talking about asking in English, and we're talking about asking in the spirit, in tongues. In both, okay? Because your asking gives God legal entry. Or jurisdiction. Can I define the word jurisdiction for you? Juris comes from the English word jury. Did you know it is not the judge that finds the, the, uh, um, the person guilty? It's the jury. The judge just carries out the sentence. But it's not the judge that says you're guilty. The judge sits back and says, jury, what do you say? Not guilty. Okay, not guilty. You're released. What do you say, jury? Guilty. Okay, you're guilty. Now, let me give you the sentence. Jury. Okay? Literally means the uncompromised word. Diction is the word speaking. <laughs> the uncompromised word spoken gives God legal entry on this planet. Jurisdiction. Okay? All right. So now we understand that we have to ask. Now, uh, let, let me go to, um, let's go to uh, Genesis. Genesis 126. You know this story. Genesis 126. God created man. Uh -huh. Yes, he did. And what did he do? He, in his, his image, and he gave him dominion. Everybody say dominion. In other words, fish of the sea, birds of the air, animals, everything on planet earth. Man had dominion. Uh, is this the Amplified? Oh, can we put the Amplified? Okay, here we go. Watch this. God said, let us make mankind, yep, what? In our image, in our likeness, and let them have what? What, what, what? Complete. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, in, um, I'm in Oklahoma. What does the word complete mean, Neil? All of it. I got the bottle. I give it to my brother Barry. Everybody say, Barry's got the bottle. Now, I, the important thing is not that Barry's got the bottle. The important thing is, I don't have the bottle. So when God gave man complete authority, how much authority did he keep for himself? So we're asking God every day to do stuff in our lives of which you have the authority. Can I say that again? We're asking God every day to do things in our lives of which you have the authority. He didn't keep any for himself. You got the authority. Man has authority over this planet. Okay? God can't move on this planet till man invites him. That's why it's important you understand that. But what happened to this authority? Let's go to Genesis 3, verse 1. Genesis 3. He had dominion. He had complete authority. Now we go to uh, Genesis uh -huh. 3, verse 1. The serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, Can it really be uh, that God has said you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? Now, this is funny. Was it really true? That's what the devil will do, put a thought. Is it really true that he carried every sickness and every disease? Is it really true that you're going to get out of debt? Is it really true that you're going to be totally, completely healed? Is that really true? To make you doubt. You know why? Because James says, He who doubts will do without. Let not that person even think 
he will receive anything from God. So always, what does the devil do? Brings doubt. Everybody say, no more doubting. Mm -mm, we ain't going to doubt the word. Uh -uh. Now, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees of the garden. Next word. Except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. Okay. God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, wait a minute. Something wrong with this statement. What's wrong with this statement? First of all, how do you tend a garden and not touch the tree? So, Adam was supposed to tend all the trees in the garden, including this one. And God never said you can't touch it. He says you can't eat of it. But you know what? When you say something to somebody who says something to somebody, down the road it gets changed. So obviously they could touch it, but they didn't. Ooh, how do you know they didn't? Watch this. Next verse. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Keep going. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Now, wait a minute. She was already like God. She was made in God's image. She was made in God's likeness. But you know what? We're already like God, but we don't know it. We perish for lack of knowledge. And that's the issue here. Okay? She didn't know she was already like God. She said, I'm going to be more like God. You're already like God. Number one, you're like God. Number two, you have all authority on this entire planet. You are the king of this planet. You couldn't be any more like God. But she didn't know. She's already like God. Watch this. Uh, and your eyes will be open. Her eyes were already opened. How do you know? Adam walked and talked with God in the cool of the day, which means he was a spirit being, because God is a spirit, but he was clothed with the flesh, which means he could walk in the spirit with God, and he could walk in the flesh and tend a garden. Did you know that you are God's greatest creation? More than, better than anything else, and you, and you are a creation of love. Love created you. Okay? And you're the only one that has the ability to go back and forth from the spirit realm to the natural realm. Because you can see in the Spirit. How do you know? Because the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. That ain't these eyes. You're led by the Spirit of God. That ain't these ears. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That is not this mouth. You have five physical senses and you have five spiritual senses. Because you can go into both realms. Amen? You can see things in the Spirit. And we should be... Jesus walked the earth but lived in the Spirit. How do you know he lived in the Spirit? Because, okay, I'll tell you that. Let's jump over there. We'll come back to this in a few minutes. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse 25. John chapter 8, verse 25. It's important that you understand you can live in both realms. Then they said to him, Who are you anyway? Jesus replied, Why do I even speak to you? I'm exactly what I have been telling you from the first. Next verse. I have much to say about you to judge and condemn you, but he who sent me is reliable or true to his word. And I tell the world only the things that I've heard from him. Where did he hear that? These ears? No. His spiritual ears. Inside he heard. Keep going. Uh-huh. They did not perceive and understand that he was speaking to them about the Father. Next verse. And Jesus added, when you have lifted up the Son of Man to the cross, you will realize that I am he of whom you look, and that I do nothing. This one, Jesus is really your Lord. When you do nothing apart from what he tells you. That's right. Of myself, my own accord. But I say exactly what the Father has taught me. He says what God told him. So he would say what God says. He would go where God says. He would do what God says. Why? He was in the Spirit. And you'll find out in some of the other series, especially the one, last one on worship, that he did this every morning before it got daylight. He didn't pray to the Father. He worshipped the Father. And it's in worship that you get direction. And that's what we're going to do Sunday night. We're going to worship God Sunday night until everybody gets direction from God. Amen? 
Anyway, so I want you to see this. So is it possible for us to do that? It's critical for us to do that. Amen? We have the ability to go into both. Then we went back to Genesis 1-5, and we found out in Genesis, 1, uh, Genesis 3 Five, sorry, Genesis 3, 5. That's where we're at. Genesis 3, 5, uh, in the garden. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened uh, and you will be like God. <laughs> Let me say this to you. Her eyes were always open. And when she ate of it, her eyes closed. It was the exact opposite. The devil was telling her a lie. How do you know her eyes closed? Because the glory lifted. He crowned both of them with glory. Crown doesn't mean on your head. It means from his head right down to your toes. They were clothed in glory. And that glory lifted. Mm. Knowing the difference between good and evil, blessing and calamity. Next verse. That tree was not the tree of life. It was the tree of blessings and cursing. Now, when the woman saw that the tree was good, huh, okay, stop right there. When the woman saw that the tree was good, what does that tell you? She hadn't been to that tree before. It's the first time she went to that tree. Wow! So she, this, she was amazed. Why? Because she hadn't been there before. But he was supposed to tend the whole garden, not apart from this tree. So it's the first time she sees the tree. And she sees that the tree was suitable and pleasant for food and that it was delightful to look at. She didn't know it was delightful to look at? No, because she'd never been there. <laughs> delightful to look at. Uh-huh. And a tree to be desired in order to make one wise. Uh-uh. That's what the devil told her. That's what the devil told her. Don't believe what the devil is telling you. Uh-uh. She took of its fruit. Okay, what was the fruit? blessings and cursings. And what did she do? The fruit was not ready. It's not that God didn't want to uh, give them that tree. It's that the fruit was not ready. No, actually that's not true. Let me, let me rephrase that. They were not ready. When they were, if they had waited and they were ready, they would have been able to get the whole thing. But they were not ready. So what happens? She takes a fruit that is cursed, a cursed fruit, and they eat it. Remember what their body was made of? Dirt. What dirt? The same dirt God commanded. We found that out yesterday. So now the curse entered their body. Or the curse entered the earth. Now you know how the curse got to the earth. All right. She gave some to her husband. So her husband was standing right next to her. She didn't have to go find him. He said, hey, oh, grab, a fruit, grab this fruit. No, no, no. He was standing right there. So he knew he was not supposed to eat. But he didn't obey the word of God. He chose to believe Satan. Wrong. Don't do that. Next verse. Verse 7. Then the eyes of them were opened. What does that mean? That means they could only see in the natural. They could no longer see in the spirit. And when they saw themselves naked, they wanted to cover themselves up with fig leaves. Uh -huh. Verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. Stop. Didn't I tell you that their spiritual eyes were closed? Didn't I tell you the glory had lifted? They didn't see God. They heard him walking in the garden. <laughs> Come on now. And they hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden, as if that would have helped. Come on. Next verse. But the Lord God called Adam and said, Where are you? Now, I believe that God called him, not because God didn't know where he was, but God wanted him to respond. So we're going through a trial. God, where are you? God's going, No, no, no. Where are you? Are you over here in your heavenly seat above every problem? Or are you back there on your earthly seat? Which seat are you in? Where are you? Mm. Now you know the rest of this story. Uh, next verse. <laughs> Go to the next verse. You need to see this. I heard the, the sound of you walking in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Now he was naked all his life. That wasn't an issue before. Today that's the only thing he could see, because he couldn't see in the spirit. Next verse. I hid myself, and he said, 
Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Next verse. And the man and said, the woman you gave me, <laughs> this is crazy, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. Don't blame the woman. Uh -uh. He knew what he was doing. He'd have a command from God not to eat and he chose to eat. And then he said, the woman you gave me. Watch this. This is heavy. God said man should not be alone. Remember that? I will make you a help meet. And he got the piece of dirt and he put it together and he showed it to the man. Is this a good help meet? He said, eh, no, nose too long. I'm going to call that an elephant. Okay. So this was all in the... So who decided if the elephant wasn't going to be the help meet? Man. Put another piece of dirt together and said, is this a good help meet? <laughs> and Adam said, eh, neck too long. I'm going to call that a giraffe. That's not going to be a good help meet. So Adam rejected every animal to be his help meet. And then, of course, you know the story. God put him to sleep, took the female attributes out of him, which is what God is both male and female, and made a different body and made female. So who rejected and who accepted what God set before him? Adam. Adam. Not the woman you gave me. No, you had a choice. You chose this one. Okay. It's all on you. Uh -huh. She gave me the fruit. I ate of it. Next verse. Verse 13. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent outwitted me, cheated me, and I ate. So I was deceived. So Satan deceived both of them to do what? To follow his instruction. And at that moment, when they chose to obey Satan and not to obey God, the authority, complete authority, got transferred to Satan. And he became the king of this world. At that moment. At that very moment, that's what happened. How do you know? Go with me to Luke 4, 5. Luke 4, 5. Luke 4, 5. Then the devil took Jesus. This is the 40 days in the desert. The devil took him to a high mountain and showed him what? All the kingdoms of the habitable world. Every kingdom in the habitable world, Jesus saw in one instant. And guess what happens? In a moment of time, in a twinkling of an eye. Next verse. And Satan said to Jesus, To you I will give this power and authority. Hmm. And their glory, for it has been turned over to me. When was it turned over to him? In the garden. When Adam chose to obey him instead of God. It was, the authority came to the devil at that moment. And I will give it to whomever I will. Now, did Jesus say, you're a liar? You don't have any authority? Did Jesus say that? No. Because he knew it was true. Satan had the authority. Next verse. Therefore, if you will do homage or worship me, I, it will all be yours. And Jesus says, uh-uh, I only worship my Father. You understand that? But what was he saying? If you worship me, I give you the authority. Jesus didn't say, well, any time, you don't have the authority to give. You don't have it. He never said that. So that means Jesus acknowledged that he had the authority, but refused to worship him to get that authority. You understand so he did have authority. It was done in the garden. Now, I'm going to make it real plain to you. Okay, uh, Neil, come up here for a second. Wesley, come up here for a second. Okay, for this example, come stand uh, next to me. For this example, I'm going to be God, okay? God, or I build a house, okay? God did it, it's called the earth. And I give it to my son, he is the title deed of that house. He's got it. Just like Adam had the title deed of this planet. What does he do? He turns it... Now, nah, I'll give you a better part next time, all right? He turns it over to the devil. We just saw that. Now, I built the house. I gave the title deed to him. He owns the house. He gave the title deed to him. Now, he owns the house. Everybody with me so far? But he's the renter. So now I see a problem that he's facing. So I come in to fix that problem. 
And you know what the owner of the house says? You have no authority here. I own the house. You don't own the house. You cannot operate here. You have to leave. So God backs out. What if the renter asks me to come fix the house? Now I come back into the house to fix it. And he says, "Uh uh-uh, I own the house. You have no authority here. You can't do that. And I say, "Uh uh-uh, you're wrong. I was asked by the renter to come fix the house. If I don't get asked, I can't just walk into the house and do whatever I want. If God wants, God wants to fix your problem, of course He does. He wants to heal you, of course He does. He wants to bless you, of course He does. But He cannot till you ask Him. Because that gives Him jurisdiction. That gives Him legal entry. Thank you, guys. You with me so far? I wanted you to see this. That's why He had to get legal entry. I, I'll show you this in the Old Testament. You, you'll, you'll, you'll like this part of it. I'll do that relatively quickly. Come with me to Jeremiah 29, 11. This is a scripture that everybody knows. Jeremiah 29, 11. God's got a good plan. Plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Yeah, okay, we'll just read it in a second. God says, I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans of welfare and peace and not of evil to give you hope in your out- final outcome. Everybody say, God's got, God's got a good plan. Now, stop right here. This is a wonderful scripture. But very few people read the scripture before. So let's read the scripture before. Let's go to verse 10. God's got a good plan for me. Hmm. For thus says the Lord... <laughs> God speaking, when 70 years are completed for Babylon. So the nation of Israel was in captivity, where? In Babylon. They were servants in Babylon. And when 70 years of captivity were finished, uh uh-huh, I will visit you and keep my good promise to you, causing you to return to this place. 70 years of captivity, and God says, then... Then, next verse, after the 70 years, I have plans for you. Plans for you what? After the 70 years. Amen? Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And next verse, how do you find this plan? Uh, Verse 12, then you will call on me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear and heed you. God is not trying to ignore us. He's waiting for us to call. If I give my cell number to Wesley and a whole year goes by and he says, Brother Nasser, you don't talk to me. And I say, Wesley, you never called. No wonder God don't talk to you. When was the last time you called? He will answer. I like to put it this way. God speaks little but answers much. Hmm. So now, next verse. Everybody say 70 years. Then you will seek and inquire of me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, the 70 years is really important for you to remember. So let's go to uh, Jeremiah mm, 25, 12. Jeremiah 25, 12. I want to show you in several places why this 70 is so important. Here we go. Then God says, when 70 years are completed, yep, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation and the land of Chaldeans, says the Lord, for their iniquity and will, make the, and will make the land of the Chaldeans perpetual waste. After how many years? So obviously the nation of Israel ha- was not, in, not doing well. They were in sin. So God had to lift his hands off them. And that's when they got captive and taken to Babylon. And for 70 years they had to stay there. And God could not move his hand until the 70 years was up. You see that? After 70 years. He said that already in his word. After 70 years. Was it God's plan to release them? Everybody say yes. yes. All right. Why didn't he release them after 70 years? Because nobody asked him. Come with me to Daniel 9 too. But it was his plan. So God had to get somebody to ask him. To even accomplish his plan. Does God have a good plan for you? Yes. Have you asked him? No. Well, maybe you should. Call on me and ask. And you will find me. Now we go to Daniel 2. In the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books of Jeremiah. Which one? Jeremiah 29.10. 
Uh huh. What did Daniel find out from that book, Jeremiah 29:10? Uh, the number of years which, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet must pass before the desolation which has been pronounced on Jerusalem should end. And it was what? Seventy years. So now Daniel finds the scroll of uh, Jeremiah. He reads the scroll and the scroll says, after 70 years of captivity, you will be released. So what does, Je what does Daniel do? He looks at his watch. He says, oh my goodness, 69 years, 11 months, and 30 days. We are that close. Keep going. Next verse. And I set my face, who set his face? Daniel. To do what? To, to seek the face of the Lord God, to seek him by prayer and supplication, fasting and sackcloth and ashes. In other words, he said, God, can I bring to you, well, come back to this, go to Isaiah 62.6. Was it Isaiah 62.6? We'll find out when we get over there. I have set watchmen upon the walls, O Jerusalem, uh -huh, who will never hold their peace day or night. You who are his servants and by your prayers. Everybody say prayers. prayers. Put the Lord into remembrance. Huh. Everybody say my prayer, my prayer. Puts, God puts God in remembrance, in remembrance. of his plan, his plan for me. You think God's got a short memory? He forgot? No. He needs jurisdiction. He needs legal entry. He's not a short of memory. He doesn't say, put, put me in remembrance of my promises because I forgot. I forgot what I promised you. Okay, Lord, you got a short memory. No, I'm going to put you in remembrance. No, this has got nothing to do with God's memory. It has to do with legal entry. Everybody with me so far? Okay, now go back to Daniel. Where were we in Daniel? I think we were in verse, uh, uh, Daniel 9, verse 3. I think that's where we were, so we'll go there. Daniel 9. Uh, what did he do? I'll set my face by prayer. Okay, everybody say prayer. prayer. So he was going to pray now, uh-huh, and remind God. Go to the next verse. Remind God of his promise. What was God's promise? Seventy years, and you will be released. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God who keeps covenant, mercy. The first word he said was covenant. Why? It was your covenant that said you would release me after 70 years. So I'm reminding you of your covenant. Okay. Who keeps covenant, mercy and loving kindness with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now I want you to go with me to Daniel Chapter 9, verse 17. Daniel chapter 9, verse 17. Now therefore, our, O our God, listen to and heed the prayer of your servant Daniel uh, and his supplication for your own sake, uh, your face to shine upon the sanctuary which is desolate. In other words, he's reminding God of his promise. What was his promise? To release us after 70 years. Now come with me to Daniel 9, 22. Legal entry, jurisdiction. He instructed me and made me to understand. He talked to me and said, Oh Daniel, I am, this is the angel, next verse. Now come forth to give you skill and wisdom and understanding. That was the angel speaking. Next verse, 23. At the beginning of your what? Prayers. What happened at the beginning of Daniel's prayers? Uh -huh. Giving an answer went forth, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. At the beginning of Daniel's prayers, the angel was released. To do what? Release the nation of Israel from captivity in Babylon so they could go home. Amen? But God couldn't send the angel till somebody asked him. Every time we ask, God does. We ask, God does. Because it gives him legal entry or jurisdiction. And we can do that in English and we can do that in our tongue language. Amen? 
That's why it's so important that you do that, because there's a whole lot you don't know, but God knows. Everybody say, God knows. Uh, come with me to Luke 11.9. You know this scripture well. Luke 11.9. We, we talked about it, but we didn't go to the scripture. So I want you to go to the scripture. Luke 11.9. So I say to you, says Jesus. T- Jesus said this. Ask and you shall, it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. In other words, I have not because I ask not. It gives God legal entry in my life. Now, you can only ask a minimum amount because you don't have uh, much knowledge of your future. But God has complete knowledge of your future. So what you don't know, you can ask in tongues. And I'll show you that in just a few minutes. That's giving God legal entry into your future. But there's one scripture God told me when I was studying this. He said, you must bring this out. So come with me to James chapter 4, verse 3. If I don't bring it out, then uh, you will wonder why things don't happen. James chapter 4, verse 3. Or you do ask, yeah, and yet fail to receive. Mm. Why? Because you ask. Now, the actual word is amiss. In the King James, you ask amiss. Now, the translation says wrong purpose, uh, evil, selfish motives. But that's not exactly what it meant. So I'm going to tell you what that word kakos means, amiss. It means you ask not in faith. When going through a problem, what are you doing? Pacing the floor, worrying. Well, that's when you pray. You're not supposed to pray when you're not supposed to ask when you're worrying. You're not supposed to act when you're full of anxiety and anxious and fear. That's not when you ask. God doesn't answer prayers of fear. God doesn't answer prayers of worry. God doesn't pr- answer prayers of anxiety. What does he answer? Prayers of faith. That's why he says, roll your cares onto the Lord. That's right. For he cares for you. Amen? That's why he says we're in a no-worry kingdom. What worry you have, give it to God with pray- through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. So now, what do you do? When you're in a situation... Listen to this advice. This is really good. Whatever trial or situation you're in, before you pray to God, go to the Word. Why? Because the Word will help build your faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing what? The Word of God. So when I was uh, uh, with a stroke, lying paralyzed in that hospital room, I went to the Word. Oh yeah, He carried every sickness and every disease. And by his stripes I have been healed. I had to get to the word first, and then that word had to build my faith. Did I believe that he carried every sickness? Yes, I did. Do I believe by his stripes I'm healed? Yes, I did. Then what am I doing in bed? I need to get up and walk. And that's why I made them, I asked them to make me walk. Because the anointing can be inside of you dormant. The healing anointing can be dormant inside of you all your life because you're not activating it. What activates it? Works. Faith without works is dead. That's why we've got to start acting like we got it. Amen? And then it totally manifested in my life. All right. Oh, you ask but yet fail to ask. In other words, don't ask in anxiety, worry, fear. Ask in faith. Everybody say faith. Because without faith, you can't please God. And without faith, He can't bless you. Amen. We live in a faith universe. It, everything is governed by faith. Faith is not a set of churches. Faith is not a denomination. Faith is a foundation of all Christianity. Amen? You've got to believe the Word of God. All right. Where was I? Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God. Now you've got to speak the word. You've got to believe that you receive. Come with me to 1 John 5.14. 1 John 5.14 is all jurisdiction. You've got to give God legal entry. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence. Oh, I've got confidence now. Yeah, what confidence? which we have in Him, that we are sure that if we ask anything according to His will. So it has to be according to His will. Everybody's got planes. I need to have a 747 jet, Lord. Uh, I have my faith out for a 747 jet. Is that God's will? I don't know. Well, until it's God's will, stop asking. 
because it doesn't mean a hill of beans. Yeah. Everybody else got a jet. I need to get a jet too. No, you don't. Because you don't need it for what God's called you to do. They may need it for what God's called them to do. Stay in His will. Amen? All right. According to His will, in agreement with His own plan, His plan. Everybody say God's plan. God's plan. Now, when I ask for something according to God's plan for my life, He listens and He hears us. Next verse. And if we positively know that He listens to us in whatever we ask... So if I'm asking what's in the Word of God, if I'm asking what's in the plan, then I know He hears me. I have confidence that He hears me. You know how many prayers never get beyond the ceiling? Because they never check the plan first. Always check the plan first. If it's in the plan, ask. It was in the plan for me to get this building. So I asked for this building, planted a seed, and I got the building. Amen? And that's the same thing. It's in God's plan. Whatever in, in God's plan for you. You know, for a pastor in India, what's God's plan for him is a bicycle. Yes. That's prosperity to him. Amen. Okay? So he gets a bicycle. He can get the plan done. He's really excited. So we got to find the plan. And then we can pray for the plan. And when we pray God's plan through his word, and it's his word who will show you his plan. Amen? So I'm praying the word. Then guess what? I know he hears me. God only speaks one language. <laughs> the word. The Holy Spirit only speaks one language. The word. Ask for whatever you want. You ain't going to get it. It's got to be the word in his plan. Amen. Then you have confidence that he hears you. And guess what? We know. Everybody say, we know. Settled with absolute knowledge that we have granted us our present possessions. In other words, we've got what we requested. We absolutely know it. Amen? Because it's in the plan. That's why it's so important to get the plan. We got it. So what's in the plan? The Word. Go to John 15, 7. We were there yesterday. John 15, 7. We ask according to the Word. Legal entry. We haven't left... The, the teaching of legal entry. There we go. Yep. Legal entry. And that's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. To help us learn the word. If you live in me. Uh huh. And my words live in you. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. So for answered prayer. God didn't say if you live in me and I live in you. Let me say that again. For answered prayer, Jesus did not say, if you live in me and I live in you. For answered prayer, what did he say? If you live in me, that means you're only asking according to my plan. And my words live in you. He's not saying that he shouldn't live in you. What he is saying is when you ask something, it better be based on my word. If you live in me and my word lives in you, then go ahead and ask. And it shall be done for you. Why? Because we're speaking the word. We went to this scripture last night. Go to it again. Isaiah 55, 11. Isaiah 55, 11. Are you getting something this morning? Amen. We've got to get this in prayer in English. And we've got to get this praying in tongues. Amen. All right. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. God has sent us his word in the form of the Bible. It will not return to me void without producing any effect. In other words, the, wo the word spoken by God comes to us in the form of the Bible. And this is God's word talking to you. But if you never read it and you never understand it, never believe it. And most important, never speak it back to God. It doesn't accomplish anything. Because he said, so shall my word be that comes out of my mouth. It, the word, shall not return void. It can go out void. But it cannot return void. So on the return journey, it accomplishes what it was sent for. Who sends the word back to God? We do. Exactly. When you speak the word back to God, you're sending it back. And on the return journey, it accomplishes and prospers what you sent it for. I'm just going to give you this as a little tip because God's reminded me twice on this and Ted brought this up to me the, uh, yesterday. You know, the Bible refers to the Word of God as a two... In fact, let's, let's go over there. 
a two-edged sword. Anybody know what scripture that is? As a two-edged sword? Mm. Huh? Hebrews 4.12? Go to Hebrews 4.12. That's a good idea. Hebrews 4.12. Uh-huh. For the word that God speaks is alive, full of power. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. Now, you know I'm not a fan of King James. You know that. King James was an evil king. He was a homosexual. He had a bunch of atheists translate the Bible. So I don't believe everything he says. I like to go to the original Greek and the Hebrew to find out what was said. The word two-edged sword, the word two-edged is actually the word dystomos. Am I right, Ted? Dystomos. I taught on this a while ago. D-I-S, dis, which means two. Tomos does not mean edged. What does Tomos mean? Mouth. So what it said? The word of God uh -huh, is like a two-mouth sword. Why is that so important? Who is the first mouth that speaks the word? God. Who is the second mouth that speaks the word? We do. This is the word dystomos. I taught this a while ago, and uh, Ted was listening to a radio station yesterday. Kathy Mink, you might have heard of Kathy Mink. She was doing a road show, and she brought up the word dystomos. And thank God, she says, my friend, Nasa Siddiqui, gave me this revelation. <laughs> and everybody listening to the radio around the state heard, oh, it was Nasa Siddiqui. <laughs> thank God she did that. Honest woman. Amen? Dystomos. You have to make, you have to put your mouth to God's word in faith for it to work, for it to accomplish what it was sent for. Can I say that again slowly? You have to put your mouth to God's word. You have to put your mouth to God's word in faith. You have to put your mouth to God's word in faith for it to accomplish what it was sent for. Got it? That's why we have to send the word back to God. And when we send it back to God, what happens? Come with me to Jeremiah uh, 112. This is what happens when you send it back to God. Jeremiah 1.12 Then says the Lord to me, you have seen well, for I, God, am alert, active, and watching over my word to perform it. Help, Lord, Satan's attacking me. That's not God's word. So he ain't going to do nothing. Help me, Lord, I'm sick. He ain't going to do nothing. But Lord, your word says, by your stripes I have been healed. Now he says, ah, I'm going to watch over my word. That was my word that came back to me full of faith. I'm going to watch over my word to perform it. Amen? Everybody with me so far? Yes. Now you're seeing why, why this thing is so, so important. We've got to get it right. Everybody say, get it right. Get it right. Go back to Acts uh, chapter 4. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 4. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Oh, you want me to do that? Okay. No, that's okay. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, or verse 4. We just go to verse 4. We went already to Acts 1, 8. Power was the power of tongues. We know that, right? Then we know they got filled with the Holy Ghost, and we know that the whole, all of them spoke in tongues. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't just they were filled. They, there was something that happened. The purpose of the inf Oh, Lord. I'm going to say it now. The purpose of the infilling was the releasing of the power yes. through tongues. Can I say that again? Yes. The purpose of the infilling was what? The releasing of God's power. How? Through tongues. The purpose of the infilling was what? The releasing of God's power. How? Through tongues. You got it? Now you understand what was going on here. Why? Because God had a plan. And God wanted to fulfill that plan. Oh, I keep kicking this thing. Kick it back. <laughs> and oh, I did it again. All right. We're going to find some tape to put it, put tape this thing down. Amen. 
So now they spoke in tongues. And the miracles that happened because of that power was number one, 18 different languages heard the gospel in their own language. We counted that yesterday. And then on top of that, 3,000 gave their lives to Christ. Is that God's will? Yes, because his will is that none should perish. So when was his will starting to come forth? After they prayed in tongues. Okay, come with me to um, Acts chapter 4, verse 30. Now this is Peter and John, they've come back. Um, and they were threatened never to use the name Jesus because they healed the crippled man at the gate called Beautiful. And they got to their own company. Everybody say own company. And they prayed. And in their prayer they said, Lord, will you stretch out your hand and perform signs, wonders, and authorities by the power of the name of your holy child Jesus. So what did they pray for? Signs and wonders. They prayed in the understanding and then they prayed in the spirit. How do you know they prayed in the spirit? Next verse. And when they had prayed in that place where they were assembled, was shaken, and they were all filled. That means topped up. Everybody say topped up Topped with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the word of God with freedom, boldness, and courage. So they prayed for signs, wonders, and miracles. Go to Acts 5.12. Acts 5.12. Was this God's will? Yes. Because he said back in, in Mark, there will be signs, wonders, and miracles following the believers. So it's definitely declared the will of God. But when did the will of God manifest? After prayer. Will of God declared in the word, prayer, and then the manifestation. Because prayer gives God what? Legal entry. Amen. Now by the hands of the apostles, the same ones that were praying in that room, what happened? There were numerous startling signs and wonders being performed. Oh, why those little signs and wonders? Why are they performed today? Why are the miracle signs and wonders being performed today? Because before the signs and wonders were prepared, guess what? There was prayer. Is it God's will? Yeah, it always is God's will. But why don't we see the manifestation today? Because nobody is praying in the Spirit. Everybody say, it's time. It's time. When you get a hold of this, you'll change your world. All right, now we see the manifestation happen. Manifestation happening. Amen. God is so awesome. 3,000 came when they prayed on the day of Pentecost. Come with me to Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28. You know the scripture well. We are assured. What are we assured? That God being a partner in their labor. Is that what it says? Now, now this is misquoted by so many Christians. Uh, we are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to His design and purpose. Let's break this down. Hmm. We've heard people say, well, you lost your job, don't worry about it, brother. All things work together for the good of God. Oh, your son is sick, oh, don't worry about it. All things work together for the good of God. No, all completely inaccurate. Now, let's break this thing down. We are assured and know with God being a partner in their labor. So who's my partner? God. And what does he give me? My tongue language. What is my labor? To speak in tongues. So God gives me my tongue language. I speak in tongues. Now he is a partner with me in my labor. What is my labor? It's praying in the Holy Spirit. All right, now keep reading. All things work together and are fitting into a plan. Whose plan? God's plan. Not your plan. His plan. Amen. Uh, for good for those who love God and are called according to His design and purpose. Well, we're called according to His design and purpose. But what part of this is missing? You pulled out a scripture out of its context. Go back to verse 26. Read, always read scripture in context. Otherwise you'll miss what was going on. So too, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. Everybody say weakness. Weakness. What weakness? Physical weakness? No. Intellectual weakness? No. Spiritual weakness? No. Let me tell you what the weakness was. <laughs> For we do not know what prayer to offer. Everybody say prayer weakness. Prayer weakness. Hmm. 
So who helps us in our prayer weakness? The Holy Spirit. How does he do this? For we don't know what to pray. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to pray, number one. He'll tell you how to pray, number two. He'll tell you how to do it worthily, number three. <laughs> so if I pray in the Spirit, I'm praying what to pray, I know how to pray, and I'm praying worthily. For if we do not know what to pray, to offer, or how to pray, or offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit... How does the Spirit help us? The Holy Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on in behalf of us with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. What is the Holy Spirit doing? Speaking in tongues. Putting syllables inside of you because you don't know what to pray. That was your weakness. I don't know what to pray about this situation, Lord. Okay, I got it. Okay, shoto oro mamama asakati mesikitiro koro mare mio. God saw the end from the beginning. So God knows exactly what you need to pray. And he puts it into your spirit so you can pray in your tongue language. Now, who gave them their tongue language? The Holy Spirit. So everybody say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Speaks, in tongues. speaks in tongues. Now watch this. John 16, 13. N never forget these scriptures. John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of, of truth, comes, he, he will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak of His own message, but He will tell you whatever He hears from the Father. So the Holy Spirit gave you your tongue language by speaking in tongues. You heard syllables on the inside, and you started uh, speaking them. But where did the Holy Spirit get it from? This scripture says he don't speak anything of his own accord. He only speaks what he hears of the Father. Everybody say, the Father, the Father. speaks in tongues. Okay. How do you know the Father speaks in tongues? Mm, come with me to 1 Corinthians 14.2. 1 Corinthians 14.2. This is how you know the Father speaks in tongues. For one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to who? Now, why would God give you a language he don't understand? <laughs> I don't know what they're saying. Jesus, do you know what they're saying? I don't know what they're saying. No. <laughs> he knows exactly what you're saying because he speaks in tongues. Now, everybody say this after me. God, God speaks, in tongues. God speaks in, tongues. in tongues. Now, therefore, conclusion, therefore, tongues must be the perfect Word of God. That means you didn't, your mind didn't add nothing to it. Your flesh didn't get involved in it. Sometimes people have a word from the Lord, thus saith the Lord. And the sentence they say is actually from God. The problem is they don't stop there. They add five more sentences that came from their flesh. <laughs> that wasn't from God. <laughs> Are you getting a hold of this? But therefore, is that word from God? Yes. Is tongues from God? Yes. So if tongues is God's word, then I put to you today, God watches over my tongue word to perform it. Because it's His word. Therefore, when I speak in tongues, I'm speaking the perfect will of God, the perfect plan of God, and the perfect word of God. Now you understand why speaking in tongues is so important. It releases the power that God wants to win the world, uh, and the harvest, to bring it in. It releases the power for signs, wonders, and miracles. It helps you fulfill the plan. And it helps you accomplish everything that God has for you to do. And as we learned, not only does it give God jurisdiction, it causes your angels to move. Are you with me so far? So is tongues important? Should we be doing this every day? At least an hour a day. I don't know how I have time. No, no. You don't have time. You make time. This is so important that you should be praying at least an hour a day in the Spirit. Amen? If you do that, your whole world will change. Your health will change. And everything in your life will change. Because you've been given an incredible weapon, the power of tongues. Are you getting a hold of this? This is so, so important. And not only, it says, uh, 
you, God watches over that tongue language to perform it because he's the one that gave it to you. He's the one that hears it and he's the one that obviously causes it to manifest in your life. Amen. Uh, let, me, let me show you a scripture that is so powerful it's almost incredible. Come with me to John 7, 38. Hmm. John 7, 38. Are you learning something today? Okay. Let's, let's stop for a minute. Before we go to John 7, 38, go back to Romans 8, 26. Let me just finish this and then we'll go on. Romans 8, 26. I kind of left you hanging there. So two is the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness, for we do not know what prayer to offer. The Spirit does. It's called praying in tongues. He, he knows how to do it worthily. So we're going to go to the Holy Spirit. And he's going to help us in our weakness, which is a prayer weakness. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings. In other words, he puts into our spirit the utterances we need to make. He uh, speaks it first, and we hear it, and we go, What am I doing? I'm now speaking what I'm hearing on the inside. Next verse. Verse 27. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints. How does he do that? Does the Holy Spirit go to God and say, Oh, oh, Neil needs this. No. The Holy Spirit puts into Neil exactly what he needs in tongues. That's the Holy Spirit part. Then he has to speak it in tongues so that God can have a legal entry. God doesn't have jurisdiction because the Holy Spirit asked the Father. God has jurisdiction because the Holy Spirit asked you and you spoke it in tongues and now you gave God legal entry into your future. Are you seeing this? You do this thing right, your whole life will change. Because the Spirit intercedes. And because you prayed, watch this, the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God on behalf of the saints according to, in harmony with God's will. This is the will of God. You're praying out your future. And what happens when you're praying out your future? Now go to the next verse. Because you prayed it out, you gave God legal entry to move in your life, and therefore we are assured and know that God being a partner in our labor, God's going to fix it because he gave me what to pray for. I don't know a lot of stuff happening in my future, but God does. And you know what? Because he gave me what to pray for, all things work together and are fitting into his plan uh -huh, for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Are you seeing this, my brothers and sisters? Because I'm praying out the perfect plan of God when I'm praying in tongues. Amen? Go, go to uh, first, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Hallelujah. For the one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands or catches his meaning. Because in the Spirit he utters secret truths and hidden things or mysteries. The King James calls it mysteries. Now let me ask you a question. Is anything a mystery to God? No, nothing. So it's not a mystery to God. It's a mystery to you and me. Once you understand that, you understand the word mystery was referring to us. Not to God. Do you know your past? Yes. That your past is not a mystery. Do you know your present? That you're sitting in the wisdom center? Yep. Your present is not a mystery. Do you know everything about your future? No. So when you're praying in tongues, you're praying the perfect plan for your future. Yeah. Are you getting a hold of this? To give God what? Legal entry into your life. Amen? Now you're starting to see how all this comes together. That's why all things will work together for the good of those that love God and according to His plan. All right, now come with me to John 7, 38. This was for years. You know, Pastor Larry, I, I knew this scripture well, but I never understood it. Now I understand it. John chapter 7, 38. He who believes in me. Everybody say, that's me. As the scripture has said, from his innermost being uh -huh, shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living waters. What does that mean? I didn't know what it meant. From his innermost being. That's from your spirit. 
What's supposed to flow from your spirit? Well, first of all, we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But whatever is coming from your spirit, number one, it's a spring. Number two, it's a river. Number three, it's a living water. You know what living waters do? They change dead situations. So what was he talking about here? Next verse. Verse 39. But he, here was, but he was speaking here of what? The spirit who who those who believed in him were afterwards to receive. For the Holy Spirit had not been given yet because Jesus was not yet glorified. So who was he talking about? Rivers? It's the Holy Spirit. And what is it the Holy Spirit gave to the church? Tongues. So when I'm speaking in tongues, I'm releasing rivers of living waters to change my situation. Are you seeing this? It's, this is incredible. I wish I'd understood this many years ago. For years I never understood it because I'm releasing rivers of living waters. 1 Corinthians 14, 18. 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I'm releasing rivers of living waters. No wonder power is released. No wonder change, things are changed. So Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, says, ah, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you or all of you put together. He was speaking more in tongues than the entire Corinthian church. No wonder he got so much revelation. He, and he didn't have one encounter with Jesus. He had many encounters with Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was his teacher. That's why he said, because of all these revelations, there were many revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Are you getting a hold of this? Who was giving him all these revelations? God. Many encounters with Jesus. What was all this happening? Because he was praying in tongues. Why don't things happen in my life? Because you're not spending an hour a day praying in tongues. But maybe you should. Maybe you should. Amen? That's why we're having this conference. It's time. Everybody say, it's time. It's time. And then on top of all of that, we go to 1 Corinthians 13, 1, and we find out that my praying in tongues releases angels. In fact, before we go to 1 Corinthians 13, 1, go to Hebrews 1, 14. Hebrews 1.14. We should have done this first. Yeah. Hebrews 1.14 in the Amplified. Hebrews 1.14. Are not the angels all ministering spirits? Angels were never created to dominate. Angels were always created to be servants. And he's released to you your angels. Like I said to you last night, God never leaves the throne. He created angels to do everything he needed to get done. Okay? So you've been given angels. Are not your angels servants to you? Yes. Sent out in the service of God for what? Let's go put the rest of this up there. Sent out in the service for the assistance. The angels are my assistance for those who inherit salvation. So who opens doors for me? Angels. Who gets me out of trial and problems? Angels. Who gets me out of danger? Angels. Who picks my car up when a 40-foot tractor trailer is coming to hit me head on? Angels. Angels do all of this. Okay? We've been assigned angels. Now you can only tell angels what you know in the understanding, which is not much. But you surely can tell angels in the spirit by speaking in tongues all that you do not know about the attacks the enemy has before you in your future. That's why it says uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. You can put this in King James. I think it says it better in King James. But I'm not sure. We'll find out. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Everybody say tongues of angels. What does that mean? When I speak in tongues, the angels hear and they are activated. We went yesterday in Psalms 103.20 that says, They hearken to the voice. Put that up there again, please. Uh, uh, Psalms 103.20. The angels hearken to what? The voice of His Word. What is His Word? The Logos Word and the Rhema Word. And tongues. Amen. So every time you want your angels to do something and you can't think of exactly how to tell them, stop praying in tongues. 
They hearken to the voice. Why? Because God's word is not just this. We found out that God speaks in tongues, doesn't he? So guess what? His word includes tongues. And that's how you activate your angels to have them start moving on your behalf. Now I'm telling you all of this because you must understand Mark chapter 4 verse 26 that you are not in the old kingdom. Do not do it the old way. It doesn't work. You are in a new kingdom now. Imagine the richest man in China comes to Tulsa, goes to Walmart, buys a bunch of groceries, and gives them Chinese yen. Will the cashier accept Chinese yen? No. So the richest man in China will go hungry in Tulsa because he didn't understand that Tulsa has a different culture and uses a different currency. And because he didn't understand that, he tried to use his old currency into the new kingdom, and it doesn't work. The currency of the old kingdom is money. The more money you have, the more success you have. But the currency in the new kingdom that you've joined is not money. It's, you know what they do with money? They make dirt roads out of it. It's nothing. Gold is nothing. The gate is a pearl. That's not the wealth in the kingdom. What is the wealth in the kingdom? Faith. The more faith you have, the richer you are. The more successful you will be. Because faith is the currency of the kingdom that you have joined. Amen? But you have to do it the kingdom way. And Jesus said the kingdom of God works like this. A man who puts seed in the ground. Everybody say seed. Next verse. And then continue sleeping and rising night and day. So you're not concerned about what happens to the seed. Your concern is, am I putting the right seed? You can't plant tomato seed and get mad with God that corn don't come. That's why you've got to pray and obey. The reason the Holy Spirit came in you was to guide you. He can't guide you if he's speaking and you're doing your own thing. You've got to follow the guide to find the path. And by the way, you're not waiting on provision. Provision is waiting on you. Where? Sitting on, sitting on the path? How do I know what path? The Holy Spirit. How do I know what seed will bring what I need? The Holy Spirit. So the kingdom now works totally on seed time and harvest. What does he do? He plants the seed and seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. He doesn't know how it's going to come, but that's not his problem. His job was simply to pray and obey. Next verse. The earth, we learned yesterday, the earth is not just the dirt, but the men that live on the dirt because they're made of earth. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. The earth is going to bring you a harvest. Next verse, verse 29. But when the grain is ripe and permits, immediately he sends forth the reapers. Matthew 39, Matthew, uh, was it 39, 13? Is that where we were? Matthew 39, 13? Oh, the yeah. The reapers. Matthew 13, 39. Matthew 13, 39. How do I send the reapers out? We'll find out. Uh-huh. The enemy who sowed is the devil, we know that. The harvest is close, and the consummation of age, we know that. And the reapers are who? Angels. When was the last time you sent out your reapers to bring in the harvest? I've been giving and giving and giving, Brother Nasa. I'm always sowing every Sunday, Brother Nasa. I ain't seen no harvest, Brother Nasa. Did you send out the reapers? You have to send them out. They don't go out automatically. If you're not sending them out, then your reapers are not bringing to you the harvest. Who are the reapers? Your angels. And I send them out in my English language, and I send them out in my tongue language. Amen? So they can do what? Influence, give me favor, and influence men to pour into my bosom the harvest of my seed. See, God's answer to your prayer is always yes and amen. He's not in the house business, not in the car business, not in the furniture business. But he is in the seed business. So what will God give you every time you pray? Because his answer is yes and I need a car. He'll give you a car seed. I need a house. He'll give you a house seed. Everything you need, he'll give you the right seed. Your job is to pray, obey, and ask God what is the right seed for what I need. And then your job is to plant it. And the moment you plant it, that seed is going to grow. And then your job is to send the reapers out. 
Angels, go forth. Bring me the harvest of the seed. I obeyed God. I planted the seed that he told me. And so I need that harvest now. Go bring in that harvest. And if, what if I'm not saying everything? Then start praying in tongues. Because they do pray and they do hear that language. And they will go out and influence men to pour into your bosom the harvest of that seed. This is what I did to get this building. This is what I did to get everything in the ministry. This is what I did to get my house. This is what I did to get the cars. Everything in this ministry came because exactly that. I prayed it out. I found the plan. I seeded what he told me for the plan. And then I prayed in the spirit. And it came to... Am I right, Ted? Ted knows. He's been with me for 20-some years. Yeah. 26 years. Yeah, I was six when we met, right? <laughs> and you were seven, right? <laughs> because I did what I'm telling you is why we are at where we are today. Okay? I'm not hiding anything. I'm giving you everything. But the key is, will you do it? If you'll do what I did, you'll get what I got. If you do what the Philippians did, you're going to get what the Philippians got. You do your own thing, you're on your own. God isn't part of it. Amen? That's why it's so important to hear and obey the voice of God. 2 Corinthians 9.10 says this, God gives seed. He's not in the car business, he's in the seed business. 2 Corinthians 9.10, God gives seed to the sower. Because he wanted that seed to hit the ground. So he didn't give it to the keeper, he gave it to the sower. Now put that seed in the ground. You obey him. Every time you get fed the word, listen. And say, Lord, what seed do I need to sow for the harvest that I need in my life? And then you pray and obey. Because he in the seed business. John 12, 24 says, Verily I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat, a seed, hits the ground and dies. It's got to be in the ground. It stays by itself. But if it gets into the ground, it bringeth much fruit. What brings my harvest? The seed, not God. God's not your delivery boy. The seed brings it. And that's why seed has in it uh, the harvest, the DNA. Come with me to Luke 6.38. The words of Jesus. This is how our kingdom works. The words of Jesus are this. Give. What happens when I give? It comes back. You can't... You can't let me just say this. You cannot outgive God. You will never outgive God. His nature... He's a giver by nature. His nature is to give you. And God wants to give you everything you need, but God is limited. By what? The seed you sow. That's why he puts a warning in here. Give and it shall be given back. Good measure, pressed down, shaking, and running over. Then he says, don't limit me. How do I limit you, God? For the measure you give determines the measure that's going to come back. God may want to give you in thousands, and you're putting $10 in the offering. God can't do it. He's got a measure ready to give to you. But he can't release his measure of harvest until you release the right measure of seed. Because your measure of seed locks in the measure of your harvest. That's why Jesus said, for the measure you give, it shall be measured back to you. When we were broke, we were given $10 amounts. We got a multiple of tens. We didn't get no million. We started giving in hundreds. We got a multiple of hundreds. I told you I was going to Bible school. We were broke. Somebody gave me a hundred dollar bill. God told me to sow it the same night. I obeyed God and somebody gave me that night a check for 360. Why to get a harvest in hundreds? I had sowed in hundreds. About to graduate Bible school, I said, Lord, I need thousands of dollars to start this ministry. I'm still in Bible school. He said, sow a thousand. Set the measure of your heart. I said, Lord, I'm in Bible school. I'm broke. God said, I'm not trying to get something from you, son. I'm trying to get something to you. You tie my hands by planting the wrong measure of seed. I obeyed God, planted that thousand dollar seed. Ninety seven days later, on the night of graduation, somebody gave me a check of sixteen thousand five hundred dollars. Somebody shout next. next. Why did I get a harvest in thousands? I had sowed in. Ah, you're getting a hold of this. To buy this building, I'm putting money together as a down payment. I'm in a meeting with Brother Copeland for the minister's conference. They're taking an offering. I said, Lord, what should I, what should I sow for this building? I wrote on my envelope, Wisdom Center Building. And I heard the voice of God, and he said, $10,000. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I need this for the down payment. God says, you don't get it. I can do more with it than you can. I obeyed God. Sister Gloria laid her hands on that seed, released a hundredfold blessing on that seed. I planted that seed. And guess what? Brother, we got this building appraised at $1.4 million for 360000 
our first million dollar harvest. Somebody shout next. Next. But you got to be willing to sow in the measure you want to receive. Amen. Can you put Galatians 6, 6 in the King James and 6, 7? This is our last scripture. Galatians 6, 6 and 6, 7. I want you to see this on the screen. Let him who is taught the word of God. How many of you can say you were blessed by the word this morning? Okay, you were blessed by the word. Praise God. Those watching on the internet, wave to me if you were blessed by the word. I see people waving all over the world. (laughs) Amen. All right. It says, if you were blessed with the word, then it's right to give to the one that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You can't eat at McDonald's and pay at Wendy's. If you get blessed with this teaching, sow into the anointing that caused you to grow, because it's going to cause your seed to grow. Amen? Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. You ain't going to reap what you prayeth. You ain't going to reap what you fasteth. You're going to reap what you soweth. Amen?